Hi, my name is Michał Dembek and I oversee and lead gamer-related research at TriEvidence. TriEvidence is an analytical agency specializing in assisting game creators, publishers and developers in making key decisions in the game dev process based on real data, in production phase, publishing or releasing, or investing in the industry. We deliver knowledge thanks to which it is easier to make well thought out decisions regarding investment in individual game projects, allocations of resources in production, as well as communication and marketing of games. In short, ultimately, we help reduce the various risks associated with game production and marketing. At the end of the day, we help investors, developers and publishers save their money. One means of doing this is by continuously monitoring and inferring from players' preferences and moods. Therefore, in this presentation, I will tell you how the science we practice at TriEvidence helps you understand how players see the gaming market and what they really crave. Okay, first I'll say a few words about what we do and how we help dev game developers and publishers on a daily basis. Then, I will share some insights from our newest quantitative studies, including hundreds of gamers, to show you some hints about what contemporary gamers think and want. First, I will show you which games gamers think are underrepresented in the market. Where do players see gaps on the market? Secondly, which universes are still underrepresented according to players? Third, I will tell you a few words about the strongest brands in genres and tell you why the top of mind marketing indicator is important for developers, not only for marketers or investors. Fourth, I will bluntly show you how you can find out what players expect from selected genres, from the most important to the least important expectations. Fifth, you will see what frustrates players in selected genres, what strengthens the fun aspect, and what is particularly desirable by players, of course. The sixth tip will be, will be uh, multi-threaded, but you will see how you can obtain a clear and ready receipt for the foundations of market desired game straight from the players themselves. Okay, so how we help. First, Gamer Experience Tracking. These are laboratory tests on games at every stage of production, from prototypes, pre-alpha to beta and even post-release. We do in-depth research of UX in our own laboratory in Wrocław. There, carefully selected players from our huge database play games. And then gamers discuss them, the games, with game psychologists, who are gamers as well, like all of us at Try Evidence. We deliver every target group of players, from strategy fanatics through horror fans to racing enthusiasts. Each game gets carefully selected and relevant players to play it. In addition to the general UX, you know, is the game is fun to play, where the player gets stuck, where these are frustrated and where they are happy. We can also include neuromarketing methods. We have our own eye tracking device, equipment for measuring electrical activity of the skin. And thanks to, to those, we can track emotional arousal at every moment of the game. We have also machine recognition of emotions from the face, etc. The second is silent review reviews. These in turn are journalistic expert opinions also completed at every stage of production, this time however up until before the release date. Based on expert opinions of gaming journalists co cooperating with us, veterans with many years of experience in the end industry, we prepare confidential reports on which aspect is a strength in a given prototype, alpha or beta, what are the market opportunities and what are the threats. We also indicate uh, how and what to improve, what is worth mentioning to the public and what is better to remain silent on, in terms of product communication, of course. For example, imagine that you were planning to quote the game as a survival horror 
and the players or our journalists told you they don't think it's a horror at all. Hence, this is what you should remain silent about, despite your initial plans. Anyway, we work with amazing journalists from Poland, UK and the US. Investors, publishers and developers also remain, uh, receive sorry, from us uh, press ratings and headlines predictions uh, related to their games from silent reviews, also known as mock reviews. The next is open source intelligence. It's directed at investors and publishers during the pre-transaction phase mainly or publishers at any stage. We analyze the market situation of the game and, and its potential from, from the conceptual phase, from, from the really basic phase. We estimate of the potential profitability of game and spot market trends together with advice on possible investment risk mitigation. The next one, uh, the next one, sorry, is, uh, is Gaming Sense. This is a set of classic quantitative methodologies of market research. In general, research is divided into qualitative and quantitative methods. In qualitative ones, like in our gamer experience tracking I, I've mentioned, we try and get an we try and get an in-depth understanding of player thought processes as well as their motivation and we also try to capture the unique and not obvious narratives on their perceptions. We try to, basically we try to reconstruct what and why they will think, how they think about the game. Quantitative research, on the other hand, like gaming's, gaming sense in our question here, um, focus on recognizing universal truths about relatively large populations of players. During gaming sense, we estimate the capacity of markets, the scale of phenomena, phenomena such as uh, preferences of the player population. We spot preferences towards specific ideas, features. We also test assumptions about markets. Um, we test assumptions made for for example, by publishers or investors, we test hypotheses. For example, will the market welcome a new RPG about dragons and knights? Will A or B settle better on the market? How often players willing to buy a DLC and for how much? Which types of players will be eager to look at the new RTS? Which type of players will be more interested in the new tank simulator than RTS or whatever, survival horror? Do women play games differently than guys? We answer these questions with objective quantitative research. And I want, you to, I want to show you the, the results and usefulness of this type of research here in this presentation as they, the, the type of research they are probably the least known and least effectively used in small studios and publishing houses. And this is really uh, what, what shouldn't be this way. The research project I want to talk about has been completed between the end of 2020 and 2021. We have interviewed over 1,200 Polish gamers in 2020 and uh, over 1,000 global gamers in 2021. Today I will only show you the data f we've, we have obtained from Polish gamers and if you are interested in the global results feel free to get in touch with us after this presentation of course. Since 2021 we have also started to build detailed psychological profiles of players as well as try to find correlations with their gaming preferences, views and thoughts. This process is ongoing and we will probably publish some interesting insights about that between the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. Okay, let's get to the point. How come can our data help you? Now I will show you the first tip. What can be seen through players' eyes and utilized to your benefit? But before I will, 
Here's a little remark about watching the markets in general. Most often, market research is done intuitively in a way which is based on existing historical data. You know, Steam Spy, VG Charts and so on, Statista.com, etc. For example, we study sales histories of certain genres or specific IPs and from such data, conclusions are made what is selling at what is currently trendy. However, this is how you remain stuck in the past. And games, let's be clear, are made for the future, not for the past. You invest in something that is yet to come, not into something that has already been. So by doing sales analysis based on the past trends, you get an answer to the question what was happening on the market. And you are looking for the answer to the question what will happen. So basic desk research, which we do also by the way, based on sales history, doesn't really show gamer preferences and how gamer preferences will be distributed in the nearest future. From the analysis of the past, you will certainly know what games people liked and played, but you still don't know what games they think are missing on the market or what games they're waiting for. In other words, from the history, you don't really know what genres would gamers love to see and play in the future. Our Gaming Sense methodologies, which I mentioned before, is in a sense like looking into a crystal ball. We may easily deliver data on what gamers think today, as well as strong hypotheses what will they welcome in the nearest future. Look at the selected data below. We asked people which genres do you think are too few and too many on the market? To over a thousand players we asked this question. If we exclude players who said they aren't sure or simply don't know about it, we get this picture which I show you on, on this slide. Players believe that there are still not enough of RPGs, adventures and strategy games in development. The smallest number of players reported shortages on the markets of action, sports and simulator games, as you can easily see. You don't see it on the slide, but from additional analysis we know that as optimally saturated players see the markets for action games, fighting games and racing games. These genres are just right. We can go and dig deeper, of course, into the, each of these types of results. For example, see how markets, market shortages are, are viewed by different players based on gender, age, economic status or occupation. For example, as we can see here, if you think it's a good idea to market a new MMORPG, you'd better communicate it to females as they don't feel as fed up by these genres, genres sorry, as males do. On the other hand, you should aim your communication of the new RTS specifically to males as they feel more than females that the gender is a gap on the market. I mean that there is a gap on the market is in, in this genre. Okay, another example. An interesting relationship between the level of education and perceived shortages in the market. As you can see, gamers with lower education feel that there are still too few fighter games on the market and they do not feel the lack of RTS as much as people with higher education level. And what can such information be useful for? For example, to run effective marketing campaigns for the game or to initially find out for whom the game is actually designed. If it's a fighting game, it is probably di directed at very young or poorly educated audience. If it's an RTS, on the other hand, it's more likely direct directed at people with higher education and as we remember from the previous slide, to a man rather than a woman. 
<clears throat> these are there are dozens of such lists and selections that objectively objectively illuminate the world of players and support decisions in quantitative research like gaming science we can you know cross section uh, our data in dozens of way whatever we like to to see is the same with settings and, and vibes if we will ask players what game universes you think are used too frequently and which ones too seldom we'll get a bunch of very interesting results let's see the biggest underrepresentation in is in the steampunk and western and cyberpunk markets this doesn't automatically mean that you have to produce only those settings no perceived shortages doesn't Automat automatically mean that certain settings will be preferred by players and will sell well. However, due to, due to their rarity, they will certainly arouse interest. It is also worth noting which of the setting markets are considered oversaturated, so pay attention to the last vibes on the chart. If you like to develop or publish a game, for example, about some generic war or, or another fantasy no logo, then you should just you know, consider it. It would be hard to acknowledge players such a game in the sea of other titles. Gamers probably won't even notice your work. The success will certainly require far more effort and resources than if you have a good and justified idea to develop a steampunk, a western or cyberpunk even setting. Let's see what about the brand awareness. Let's go further. It's another story. It's one of brand awareness indicators I want you to show and elaborate a bit. Brand awareness, as you probably know, is a marketing term that describes the degree of gamer recognition of a game by its name. Creating brand awareness is a key step in promoting a new game or revive, reviving an older brand. In our industry, brand awareness refers to the familiarity of consumers with a particular game. Games that maintain a high level of brand awareness are likely to generate more sales. But they are also act as referrals, those games are also act as referrals in their categories, e.g. game genres, acting as category. What I am about to show you is so-called top of mind awareness. It generally refers to which brand the largest, the largest percentage of consumers think of first in category. Top of mind is the first brand that comes to mind when a gamer is asked an unprompted question about a game genre. Market researchers, researchers use this percentage to go the most popular brands in an industry. For investors and C-level executives, this measure is one of important brand equity measurements. For us here, however, top of mind awareness has another meaning, maybe even more commonly used on a daily basis. Each of the top of mind brands become a baseline in a genre. It is an anchor in gamers' brain. It is a collection of must-have features, so-called point or points of of parity so let's look at that let's look at those anchors first of all action games what we see here are IPs recalled spontaneously by at least 10% of gamers these brands set baselines in a genre what does it mean a baseline if you decide to develop an action game, no matter your production and marketing budget, you must take into consideration that gamers will relate your game to the top of mind brands in the category Call of Duty, GTA and Uncharted. In some way, of course. 
Want to make an open world in multi-threaded storyline? Okay, okay. But you will be compared with GTA. You have to remember about it. You shouldn't be offended by it. You just have to live it, live with it. If you want to make, for example, a pure action game, a roller coaster, you must understand that due to the next installments of Call of Duty, players are used to super precise, precise and extremely expressive dosing of emotions. And you, will you be able to cope with it in your game? You don't, you, you don't have to abandon your, your intention, of course, to do an action game because you won't be able to jump over the experiential value of Call of Duty. No. But you need to understand what references in the category is in the midst of the players. Are you looking towards action adventure on the other hand? Okay. But remember that due to the undisputed residence of Uncharted in players' minds, the excitement, collectibles and secrets must be really well thought out. At least in the mass market, you will be compared to some games, even if you think that no one will compare my indie game to Uncharted or to Call of Duty, for God's sake, they will, they will. There will be, of course, enthusiasts who perfectly understand that the real value of game is not necessarily in its production value. But at the end of the day, these category killers have set up points of parity. They must have concepts and features if you like to compete in the mass market and to win the crowd. These are must-have concepts you have to face. That's just the usefulness of of the of the brand uh, awareness concept here let's look at fighting fighting games i'm not a fan of fighters i played them addictively in my childhood of course on the so-called you know slot machines uh, on commodore 64 and amiga mm, so i won't get into much detail here as i'm not an expert in this field but today if you are going to create a fighting game, your sword of Damocles, anchors of the idea of this type of game, are primarily Tekken and Mortal Kombat. These titles are in the minds of players, primarily. They will act as benchmarks in the minds of players as they experience and judge or rate your game. That's life. Hack and slashes, yeah, Diablo. Sometimes the master of the category is only one. And that's true for, for, for the hack and slash market. There is only one really big brand there, Diablo. Some less popular hack and slashes, uh, referrals in the gamers' minds are Devil May Cry or God of War. But first, in fact, these games are slashers, not, not hack and slashes as most of professionals understand the genre and moreover they're mentioned in just under 8% top of mind declarations so they're rather weak references the one really matter reference is is Diablo we see the same situation in MMORPGs the king of the category here is only one World of Warcraft each new game in this category will be for sure referenced to it, to the world of Warcraft. In adventure, there are two dominants in the category. I have already uh, talked about Uncharted, so let's uh, took, let's let's took let's look sorry, <laughs> let's look at the Tomb Raider. Um, if you are making an adventure game, you won't be able to make it without delicate markings of you know interactive objects rock shelves on which you can climb which somehow stands out from the environment and of course it won't work without balanced puzzles either these types of games doesn't exist without puzzles 
One would also like to say that any adventure which doesn't uh, adventure game which doesn't present at least a great visual setting will be poor. Players won't demand absolutely stunning views of every game like in Tomb Raider. But as a developer, you must understand that extreme visuals are the benchmark for players in the genre, in adventure genre. That's that's the truth about about the world. And at last, as the last, I present you top of mind in RPGs. Here possibly you can witness the eff effect of, of local participant sample Polish players. For Polish players, The Witcher is an epitome of RPG. Famous Skyrim follows far away as, and somewhere even farther we can see good old Baldur's Gate, by the way, what a timeless referral. Let's look at that. Understanding how difficult it is to create RPG with a chance of success on the mass market today can start with, with just such simple indicators. Since the benchmark in the RPG category are such well-designed and in every way complex games like Witcher or Skyrim, you already know that it would be it will not be easy to fight for the hearts of players with a nice open world or interesting just you know interesting side quests the bar is set extremely high we certainly don't have time to go through all the genres here but i think you can imagine what kind of insights we may obtain even from the simplest questions such as what is the first game that comes to your mind when you think about the genre X, Y or Z? I hope you understand the idea, you got it, and uh, we can move a bit further to the fourth hint, uh, which is gamers' expectations from genres. What they want, what they don't want. I will show you something perfectly practical for, for developers here but also useful for publishers and conscious investors, in fact. The strict players' player expectations. You don't have to guess anything here. First, we asked players and industry journalists the following question. What do you expect from the XYZ genre? And then they wrote, wrote, wrote down their expectations and sent them back to us. We, col we collected their answers, reduced them to common denominators, categorized, and then creator, uh, created sets of expectations relevant to each of the studied genres. Then we asked over a thousand players to mark their expectations on the scales. And now I will show it to you. See how it looks like in practice. And here we have the expectations from, from the genre as seen by gamers, but notice that RPG enthusiast only. What we can see? We can see that gamers need a complex story, far more than in other genres. They need morally ambiguous protagonists, such as Agent 47, John Marston, or assassins in, in the Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed series. And they also need a decent creator of characters. These are needs that you can probably imagine and figure out being a gamer yourself. But the next continua are not so obvious, I think. Look at that. I bet that working on RPG game, you or the team have asked yourself endless questions about how complex the combat should be, how complicated or, or generic quest should be, if it's a good idea to turn a complex crafting system into the game's unique selling point, etc. To avoid the biases, such as so-called you know, group thinking and various misconceptions, it, it, it's good to see the truth from the outside, from you know, statistically sound sources. What we see here is that gamers only have more or less strong views on combat. It should be not oversimplified, for sure, 
but not so you know complex also quests they should be balanced not necessarily highly complicated i think it's that's something not really obvious even you know and the crafting system from time to time some of developers asked us whether it's a good idea to make it kind of you know central point of an rpg in fact gamers rpg enthusiasts need it not too complex as you can see of course there are various subtypes of rpg gamers more hardcore more casual for example and each of them each of groups might have different views on on selected features for example you don't see it here but the older player the simpler the combat system they expect but also the m more complicated puzzles for example the more the player belongs to the group of trendsetters the more morally ambiguous characters they expect and the more complex the combat system systems have to be women expect for example much more much more extensive character creator than men and men on the other hand um, need greater complexity in fight and so on and so on so we can easily figure out what people what particular gamers need from from games here last but not least gamers don't want to be bothered by basic needs as you can see uh, as the need to eat or drink or or rest for example so basically unless you are rockstar you can make do without such fancy fancy features you can you can make your game without such fancy features it's a waste of your potentially scarce resources to to go into such you know basic needs for example that's the objective truth just imagine now how can you implement it how could how can you implement it into the data driven data driven game development let's go to the to the fifth hint sources of fun uh, i will continue with the rpg genre uh, we may also see what is particularly frustrating and what makes the rpg particularly fun we have asked gamers to gamers to sort out the features in order from the most frustrating to the less frustrating in their own experience let's see what we have here the first and the foremost frustration is boring characters which is by the way coherent with rpg enthusiasts strong need for complicated morally ambiguous protagonists the next pain is related to recently very trendy concept of open world and yes it's okay to have an open world in rpg it's it's perfectly okay but if you decide to go in but you if you decide to uh, to go into such a game design you have to remember that it has non it has not only be populated with objects people and beautiful locations you have to remember that it's not only about that first of all it must be motivating it must be entertaining because people need complex stories and relatively simple quests they love to experience something significant thrilling unobvious terrifying enlightening whatever but it should be significant it is probably better to deliver a closed pipeline world full of Meaning, meaningful encounters and thrilling adventures than an open world which is just you know a space a world just for being the open world even if it's a bunch of somehow you know living locations as long as their the world is not experientially entertaining it will fail in the perception of gamers okay uh, for a change let's look at frustrations in the adventure in, in the adventure games for another example of frustrations look players are mostly frustrated in adventure games with the feeling of little influence on the story 
and predefined fixed ending. If you know something like that from the research, what are you doing? Detroit become human, right? Honestly, when I watch Detroit and compare, compare it into uh, our results, it looks like the Quantic Dream knew such a list of frustrations and have addressed it one by one when creating this game. Anyway, if you have to win adventure enthusiasts, you must show them the, the crowd, you must show them how important their decisions are. You have to remember about the optimal arrangement of save points. Uh, you have to remember not to exhaust the player with too many quick time events. And uh, you know, it's, it's purely practical. We practiced these issues heavily during, for example, our research on medium game from Bluebird team in our laboratory. It's ser seriously, purely practical thing to, to, you know, to base your game dev on, on data, on, on just, you know, objective truth. There are, of course, more frustrations in the ranks, which you don't see because I didn't want to overload slides with data. I showed, I showed you just, you know, the most severe ones. I hope you, you will understand uh, our limitations here. Okay, now let's look at the other side of the coin, the creators of, of fun in games. In RPGs, gamers appreciate moral dilemmas. They appreciate also tough decisions impacting the game. They like to face non-obvious challenges, non-obvious situations. That's what the data gathered through our studies is telling us. What is also important here is the notion of side quests. They must deepen the story and background. They must deepen immersion. Please mind that looking at the big picture from this study, it does not necessarily mean that quests have to be complicated. Again, they have to be meaningful. They must trigger some new experiences and give a sense of deep exploration, gaining knowledge, better understanding of the world. Not necessarily over, you know, being over complicated. The Witcher is one of the best examples how it can be achieved the right way. In The Witcher, main quests and side quests are not always complicated in terms of design, if you we all know it. However, each quest is unique. Each quest enriching the player with the new knowledge. Not, maybe not each, but most of, of them. They are offering an interesting experience and they encouraging reflections. That's why they're really, really great stories. In adventure, game creators we see uh, there are elements which I, which I have already mentioned earlier, an impact on of, of player on the game, excitement, thrill, unique, meaningful experiences, even the taboos and serious themes like you know such as harassment, racism, terrorism, religion. It's something worth remembering, in my opinion. Controversy doesn't always go hand in hand with marketing, it's for sure. But we know this from our studies, mostly the secret ones under NDAs, that when well constructed, properly presented and above all justified in the story, controversies can do the trick. Let's go to the to the hint six. Now I will focus on a more general and more fundamental question that's of particular importance if you if you are in the beginning of a new game dev or publishing process project. Or maybe if you are an investor in game industry. It's a question about the future and about the perfect world. It's a part where our crystal ball, let's say, glows the brightest. What games would gamers make for, for, for themselves, if they could? 
That is, what games will have a particularly good chain chance to succeed? That's what I will show you now. We have asked gamers like this. Imagine you are a game developer. You have a production budget and a team of talented people who can produce any game you want. Designers, writers, artists, animators, programmers, level designers and all the other people you'd need to make a game are at your service. What kind of game would you make? I guess no surprises here. People would create an RPG. This research was performed on a completely different sample than the one I have reported earlier, but it's totally convergent. RPG is still the genre to explore, full of gaps in the perception of players. The next question to gamers was, if you want the game to combine genres, select the second complementary genre. And here we, here we see again the domination of RPG, but also action and adventure. So the clear conclusion from these results is that action RPG with rather pronounced adventure elements is still the most desired genre. Even if it's, you know, very popular, it's still the most desired genre. Another question was about the most desired atmosphere. As you can see, there is one very distinct dominant, fantasy. Coming next, Postapo and Gangsta were much less popular as the dominant game vibe. As you may remember from the previous slides, about 40-50% of players see gaps in the market in post-apo and gangsta settings. So there is a lot of potential for market exploration here, for sure. And an interesting, particularly interesting case is Steampunk. As you may remember from, from previous slides again, Steampunk was perceived by a huge number of players as a huge market gap that needs to be filled. Meanwhile, they wouldn't choose steampunk setting for themselves. So there is no direct link. There, there seems to be no direct link between I see the gap in the market and I would like to buy the game in this setting. Sometimes players see gaps in the market, but they, they wouldn't buy games that fill them, those gaps. That is why it is so important to look at the players from different angles, to study various aspects of the perception of, of the market uh, and the gaming industry landscape. It's also very important to study gamers, you know, from desk research perspective, quantitative data perspective and qualitative research perspective, which we also do in gamer experience tracking, as you probably remember. Here players, just like with the preferred genres, could add an extra vibe to their dream game. As you can see, the second vibe most often chosen by, chosen by players was historical. And what kind of history would they add? Let me show you. So we asked players, in what historical period would, you, would the game be set, your game be set? Among surveyed Poles, uh, people from Poland, gamers from Poland, 35% of players had no particular historical period in mind. So you could set your game in some kind of historical void and gamers would have no problem with it. But if you want to set it up in some kind of defined box, especially thinking about fantasy vibe and RPG genre, Middle Ages are still the safest option. That's evident, at least for, for mass marketing. The last desired period in gamers, uh, gamers games, imagine games were interwar period, prehistory and the first imperialism. Uh, and interestingly, World War, War I and World War II were also ranked very, very low. As did, probably you remember, as did the war vibe in general. Um, if you remember from, from the previous data shown. So, um, Middle Ages are generally acceptable and safe, but it's better to stay away from the strictly defined time-specific wars. What about, what about the story, the type of story? 
we, we asked gamers what will games story be mainly about. Some of you are probably familiar with the save seven basic plots um, by Christopher Booker, the book by Christopher Booker. We asked gamers to choose from uh, to, to choose one of the seven, uh, one of the seven plots, the one which would be a foundation of their imagined game. Of course, gamers saw the descriptions of each plot, etc. So they will well informed about what they are choosing. The conclusion is there are two clear tendencies. Gamers love the rebirth plot and rarely choose comedy. Rebirth means that the events in the game will force the main character to reevaluate their life and rules and to change the way they perceive the world and uh, they just become a better person. It's quite a difficult plot archetype, but that's exactly the type of the story of the story players want. The comedy is the most straightforward one. One uh, that you know the light and humor humorous story is something you should avoid, unless you are making an obvious pastiche like Untitled Goose Game or Goat Simulator. You should avoid it. We did uh, an anal analytical and laboratory project for. Uh, uh, for a parody game some time ago and the conclusions were hardly optimistic. It is very difficult to make players laugh sincerely and parody games are rarely successful on the market. So if you like to do that, uh, you have to beware and uh, it's like, you know, 50-50 if they will succeed. We have also investigated the desired protagonist archetype. Uh, if we put gamers' preferences, expectations, pains and gains all together, it's not, surprise, not a surprise that the most desired archetype is the outlaw. Uh, I won't go into the details what are archetypes and you know what are the origins of archetypes from the theory of Carl Gustav Jung and so on. If you are interested in, please read the book The Hero and the Outlaw Building Extraordinary Brands Through the Power of the Archetypes by Margaret Mark and Carol Pearson. It's very interesting reading, so I recommend it to you uh, if you like. Anyway, the outlaw is the character. The outlaw is, uh, is an archetype who above us values freedom. He or she does not accept any rules. He or she wants constant changes or even goes mad. He or she usually wants a revolution, strives to change the world and fix what's broken. Of course, uh, all our players, our gamers, our, our participants uh, were informed about every uh, you know, archetype, which of archetype means what. So they well, were well informed about it. As you remember, gamers need morally ambitious characters, moral dilemmas, and, and you know, seek complex heroes. And the outlaw, which were chosen by the most, uh, the, the, the biggest population of gamers, meets such needs perfectly. Gamers and especially RPG enthusiasts are frustrated by you know flat characters. The outlaw is never flat type. You can see it. You, you can see it on the slide. But the less desired archetypes were supposed to be a lover, innocent, and caregiver, and they gained one to seven percent votes, main, meaning that gentle protagonists were not desired types. So uh, stay away of them if you design some, you know, game with a vast story, a sound story. Stay away from uh, a lover or gentle protagonists. The last interesting point that I would like to make in this presentation is the most desired mythologies uh, or cultural references that players uh, want in their games. Um, this area is characterized by, by, by the most significant differentiation of all the results in terms of the origin of the sample. Among polls, that is in, in chart that you can see on the slide, Slavic mythology gained the most interest. 
if we get rid of the Slavic mythology and Slavic culture, which is the most desired by Polish gamers, we'll see an interesting pattern of choices with, with the non-obvious Japanese culture at the forefront of gamers' interests. That, this is something, you know, really um, surprising us in uh, a try evidence and me personally also. Um, among the Americans and the British, uh, of course, all the English and Arthurian uh, mythology ranked first. Uh, for Germans, it was Viking and Nordic mythology, which is also not a surprise. Uh, Russians, similarly to Poles, showed preference for Slavic methodology, but closely followed by Viking, uh, more than Polish sample. Uh, one very important disclaimer uh, must be made here. Remember that the results of the desired myth myth mythologies have to be used very carefully. Uh, you really need to know what game mechanics you are trying to make, which key, key markets you are targeting and what kind of players the game is targeted at. This is the point that, um, you know, Polish players, German players, uh, Japanese players, etc. are really different, might be really different. So when you know perfectly what is the target of your target group of your game, uh, then you can ask, you, you should ask the target group what exact cultural background they would prefer for the specific game idea. Mm. Unless, of course, mythology is defined by default as the foundation of game. Maybe you, you know, invented it as the first point of the game design. Thank you. As you can see, science can support game dev. I hope you see it. Uh, it can help investors, developers, publishers in a very direct way, as you saw, I hope. Uh, it helps showing phenomena and trends here and now uh, with a very high proba prob probability of predicting tomorrow. Um, let's try to summarize briefly what I have just shown you. If I were a developer, publisher or investor, importantly for a Polish market, let's say, I would avoid creating or financing purely war-themed games, except building genres such as classic strategies or RTSs. I would be particularly interested in steampunk and fantasy with historical vibe settings. I would focus on stories involving uh, outlaws and their rebirths. Uh, I would love to see ambiguous, morally demanding experiences designed in the way that allow players to have an impact on the story and gameplay. If I wanted to play safe on the market, I would consider an RPG that combines fantasy with the medieval vibe, non-obvious, ambiguous heroes and hard-hitting stories. But at the, uh, at the same time, I would know that creating something that will fit positively in social imaginaries of players created by reference brands, especially, you know, top of mind ones like The Witcher or Skyrim, will be very, very difficult. I would look at the rankings of frustrations and fun creators, inv investigate the players' needs carefully, and um, who knows, maybe it would, wouldn't be that hard to, you know, step by step address the problems of the players and their needs and to create a really good game with a high chance of, of succeed. I hope you, you enjoyed this journey through the tons of data and found it insightful. As I, I noted um, earlier, I did not show you all the data and the insights uh, that we are gathering at Try Evidence. If you are interested in particular data, methodology or research, just drop me an email, of course. We will more, we'll be more than happy to, to answer all your questions. Thank you very much and see you.